will be carrying out the, the second part of the in-class test. Um, tomorrow I'll do some revision activities towards that. I'll have a look at some of these mock papers and give you space to ask any questions and answer any queries that you might have and do some work examples and so on. I haven't put the algebraic split to the class, so we'll take half of you in this 11 o'clock session and the other half of you in the 12 o'clock session. Uh, I'll have that information for tomorrow. So it'll be a similar split to last time. And also, um, I've just booked a room for later on in the Wednesday, so if, you, if, you, if you're a student who has a PLP, which has differences to the assessment times or assessment arrangements, um, those tests will be taking place later on in the Wednesday afternoon, uh, and I'll send you an email either today or tomorrow about that. So in the meantime, for preparing for the, for the, for the second class test, you should be reviewing all the material we've done since the first class test, and re-looking at all the tutorial exercises, re-studying everything, and as well making use of those two mock papers to get an idea for kinds of questions that we want to ask. Okay. So tomorrow's se session, um, I can take any answer, can take any questions or queries, and also look at some of those more questions. Okay. So in this chapter four, then, so where are we in the notes? Well, today we're going to look at this uh, last section in chapter four on kinematics problems. So we're interested in it as an application of the concepts of the derivative and integration and so on. Um, we'll do some example problems. We'll mainly work through, through examples. Then the tests will be next week. And then the following week, we'll spend two or three weeks going through this final chapter on groups. So this is quite different material to what we've been studying um, up to now in this unit. It's much more discrete, kind of, as opposed to continuous calculus type stuff, um, but we're looking at groups which are, which you've already been studying kind of, because you've been studying vector spaces in your, in your algebra unit. Vector spaces are examples of groups, uh, but groups are a much more general topic, um, and we'll be looking at some concepts related to groups in that final chapter, <coughs> uh, chapter five. So that will occupy us for the last two or three weeks, this week seven, week eight the test, week nine, 10, 11, 12. Yeah, so the last two or three weeks of lectures, and then we can do some revision material as well. Okay, so where are we? We're looking at the kinematics. Okay, so depending on your study of maths up to now, you may well have come across this topic, and um, you may not. Um, but we're doing it, we're having a look at it as a, as a nice source of examples of using the derivative and integration. So kinematics are these way of studying uh, these kind of motion problems. And we don't really spend too much time looking at the physics of the situation, but kinematics just looks at basically how, the, how these systems evolve where you're looking at position, velocity, and time of various models. Now, some people, uh, a lot of people, when they've studied this before, they learn about so-called SUVAT equations. SUVAT equations. And SUVAT equations are so named after the typical traditional names for the parameters, S, U, V, A, and T, and so on. And there's a whole bunch of these equations for use in different circumstances, depending on, depending on what information you know and what information you desire to calculate. Um, but I'm going to suggest to you that you, well, I won't say memorizing equations is a bad thing, but it is a slightly problematic thing, because when you try and memorize a load of different equations, well, the danger is you might misremember them. And also the danger is that you're, you know, you're just kind of learning things off by heart, and, and well, you might misremember them, but you're maybe also not taking full, full account of the meaning of the things, or you might get too attached. You might get too attached to the particular letters that are used in the version that you're learning. Whereas the letters don't mean anything, they're just labels for these 
concepts. So what I suggest is that we don't need to remember these equations. We can, in any particular situation, we can regenerate the appropriate SUVAT equations. <coughs> so they're not the kind of things we need, we need to remember. What we do need to remember, though, is the fundamental idea at, at the heart of the model. So if we're studying, if we're studying situations where we're focused on the position, velocity, and acceleration of a thing, well, we just need to remember what the definitions of these concepts are. Now, in the problems we're going to look at, we typically are just looking at one-dimensional motion, the motion of something in in a in a straight line. So our function x of t is the one-dimensional location of something. So time we think of as t. So x of t is the position of the body or object at time t. But then we have the velocity and acceleration of, of the wave. But all we need to know, really, and to, to remember, is that velocity is the derivative of the position. And accelerate, the, so, so the rate of change of position, velocity of something, how fast something is moving and in what direction, is how fast its position is changing. And acceleration is the rate of change of velocity. So acceleration is the first derivative of velocity. Acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity. Or by extension, then, acceleration is the second derivative of the position. So velocity is the first derivative, so acceleration is the second And so we'll see now in some of these examples how we shan't start by plucking an appropriate SUVAT equation out of the air that relates these things, but rather just taking the information given in the question and with Remembering these key principles, the, what the relationship is between uh, position, velocity, and acceleration, being able to generate the appropriate position in, in, uh, in each instance. Yeah. And the one bit of physics we're taking the account of maybe is the influence of gravity for some of these problems. The gravity is a force which here on Earth induces an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second per second down. When it's allowed to, when it acts on a on a free body. So we've got some simple enough examples here, which we're going to have a look at. So what we want to emphasize here is the role of the derivative and integration, and being able to take the information presented in the question and get it down in a sensible sensible way, make some sensible decisions about how to set up our analysis and how to work it. Had to work too and get some get, get some nice nice conclusions. So we'll have a look at these examples. Uh, the first one is fairly straightforward, and the second and third are maybe a little bit more a little bit more involved. So this is example four point twelve. So in the, in the first question, you can see there on page 68, um, we're told that a car is waiting at a traffic light. The light turns green, the car accelerates constant rate of acceleration. So this is a change in velocity of 6 meters per second per second for 4 seconds. What velocity will the car reach after 4 seconds and how far will it go? So this isn't too complicated. Okay, here's our traffic light, whatever. Here's our car. Um, and, well, it makes sense to think of this as the x-axis and to think of this position, the starting position of the thing as zero, and that the car is going to move in the positive direction. So we would let x of t denote the position <coughs> position of the car, bumper of the car at time t. With positive direction, positive direction of x in the direction of travel that the, that the car is going to be moving. I've been very careful and maybe a bit pedantic about setting up the meaning of things, but 
For the more complicated problems, you do have to be careful about deciding where the origin, or you, you just have to be clear on specifying where an origin is, specifying what direction things are moving in. So, now, what do we know? Well, let's well let's say at time zero, the light goes green. So we know a few things, i.e., at time zero, we're at position zero. Okay? Because in the instant that the light goes green, the car is at the starting point. We also know that at time zero, B at time zero is also zero. Because we're told the car is waiting at the traffic light. So it's, when the light turns green, the car is in good. So where v of t equals the derivative of x of t is the velocity. <coughs> and then the acceler so the acceleration the acceleration is um, six meters per second per second. So the acceleration is six for well, let's say for all values of t, where do we need to be zero? Okay, so when the light turns, when the light turns green, we've got a constant acceleration of six meters per second per second. I put the all in quotes. I mean, obviously the car cannot maintain a constant rate of acceleration for too long because it will eventually go to speed of light or something. So, but some kind of all reasonable values of t in a short time period until it gets to the limitations of the car. So what I'm just trying to emphasize here is getting very clearly down the information it, it, given, in the, given in the question. So this, this information about the constant rate of acceleration is given fairly explicitly in the question, but the initial values of x and v um, is not given so explicitly. It's, it's, it's there in the question, so we're told the car is waiting at the traffic. So we, we decided to position the origin at the traffic light, say. So it's, it's kind of our decision to make the initial location of x to be zero. <coughs> but then the fact that the car is waiting, that means the initial value of the velocity is going to be zero. OK, well, we're told, so where can we go for this? So we, we, we need to obtain. We need to obtain expressions for, because we're asked about position and what the position of the car and what velocity is. So we need expressions for x of t, uh, v of t, t greater than or equal to zero. And in particular, at particular, particular at t is four, because that's what we're asked about. So we just need to remember the basic principle about how position, velocity, and acceleration are, are related. So velocity at time t is going to be the integral of acceleration at time t, okay? Because acceleration, acceleration is the derivative of velocity. So this is our integral of the constant 6 dt. So this is, of course, 6 times t. Plus, plus a constant, so you get a constant of integration. But what is this constant? Well, the constant clearly is equal to v of zero. If the integral is 6t plus c, and if you evaluate v of zero using this integral expression now, you've got 6 times zero plus c, so you've got c. So the constant is, in fact, the initial value of of the velocity. And we've already decided from our modeling and from the information in, in the question that this <coughs> is zero. Okay. So the velocity is simply 60. Similarly, position at time t is going to be the integral <coughs> of the velocity at time t.
and this will be what three d squared plus a plus a constant d. But again, this constant, in the same way, this constant is the initial value of x. If you evaluate x <coughs> and t equals zero, you get three times zero plus d. And well, it's, it's our modeling that decided that the position of time zero was going to be zero. So we've successfully got these uh, got these expressions. So we can decide. We can give give the answer now. So at time t equal four, power is located uh, x of four, <coughs> which is um, Or we're asked for so three times 16, 48 meters, 48 meters from the from the pipes, and is tra traveling at e of four, which is 24 meters per <coughs> second. Straightforward. Straightforward enough, perhaps. I mean, the short, you know, you, you could have recognized and shortcutted to the solutions just by, well, you know, you do integrate acceleration, integrate velocity, get the answer. But putting down the descriptions at least makes it explicit, you know, how you're setting up the problem, what the things mean, and what the, I mean, it's good to emphasize as well what the, how these decisions were arrived at. So this decision that x of zero equals zero is kind of our, modeling decision. Why is V of zero is zero? Well that's the information that the car is the car is waiting at the traffic light. It's <coughs> stopped at the traffic light. So that means when the traffic light turns green the car is moving. So I think you'll agree that one is perhaps Quite straightforward. So well, let's look at one that's a little bit more involved, which is uh, question two. Okay, so question two concerns a student who's running to catch running to catch their bus. They see the bus start to pull away from the stop. The student is 20 meters away and are running at their top speed of five meters per second. If the bus accelerates away at two meters per second per second, can the student catch the bus? Okay, so it's by no means immediately <laughs> obvious. A little sketch of the situation can help. We got a bus stop. <clears throat> I mean, I guess this question, I guess, what's, I mean, you could say, well, if the bus is driving, it's not going to let the student on. Maybe we're think, maybe I was thinking about a little bit of these old London buses, you know, we might actually be able to jump on the back, the ones with the open, the open, the open back, uh, the open back entrance, like in the old days. So, yeah, I guess that's not explicitly stated. Okay? But assuming we can hop onto the moving bus. Okay, so this was before maybe <clears throat> health and safety laws tightened up. So the old-fashioned London buses, which didn't have a back door on, you could just leap onto the onto the back of the bus if, if you could catch it moving away. There's a student running towards the bus. Okay. Now, what kind of information are we told? We're told the student is 20 meters away from the bus as the bus starts to pull away. So. You know, we need, we need to make some decisions. So 
we need to give ourselves an x-axis. Bus stop is maybe the point of reference, the one fixed point. Everything else is moving, so maybe it makes sense to make the make the bus stop be position zero. And we've got two different things moving. So we've got two, two position functions. So let's call them xb of t, position of the bus at time t. And xs is the position of the student. Um, and we're given various bits of information. <clears throat> and BB, AB, BS, AS, the velocity and acceleration. Bus and student respectively. Okay, so we'll still use our XBA <clears throat> notation and just use the subscript to indicate whether we're talking about the bus, bus or the student. So, what kind of information are we given? Well, you see, <laughs> we're told the student is 20 meters away from the back of the bus. So, that means the position of the student times zero must be minus 20. So at t equals 0, the bus begins moving in the positive direction, let's say. So the initial position of the student times 0, we should call that minus 20. The initial position of the bus at time 0 is going to be zero, the initial position at the back of the bus. We're trying to get down here the information we're given. See, we're told the velocity of the student, well, what are we told? We're told the student is running at their top speed of five meters per second. So the velocity of the student is five meters per second, and the acceleration of the student is zero for all, and for all reasonable t. So, so the velocity of the student at time t is the constant five for, well, for as long as the student can maintain their maximum speed. <clears throat> so for some reasonable interval of time where the student can maintain their top speed. Very long. You can't maintain your top speed very long. <coughs> Sorry, that's the acceleration of time t is zero for t. For t greater than equal to. Um, and what's the bus doing? Velocity of the bus at time zero is zero because it's beginning moving. So at time zero, the bus is at velocity. Um, but the acceleration of the bus time t, where we're told the bus is accelerating at 2 meters per second. So the bus is moving with constant acceleration, at least for a reasonable interval of time. So that seems to be all, that seems to be all the information from the question coded onto the page. In terms of our three functions, x, b, and x, b, and a. Of course, the three functions are related by differentiation or integration, depending which direction you're going. And um, well, what do we want? Well, what do we what do we want? We want to know if the student can catch the bus. So, is there a reasonable Is there a reasonable value of t greater than or equal to zero such that the position of the student at that time is equal to the position of the bus at that time? 
answer the question. Bus is moving away, the student is running, can the student catch the can the student catch the bus? The student will certainly get nearer to the bus because the student's running five meters per second, the bus is stationary at the beginning. So the, the student is certainly going to approach the bus closer to the bus than 20 meters, but will they get close enough? So well, if we want to answer this kind of question, is 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 x of s ever equal to x of b? We should try and obtain try and obtain x of s and x of b. And then once we obtain nice formulae for them, we should be able to hopefully decide if, if they're ever equal. So, the position of the student is going to be the integral of the velocity of the student with respect to time. We're assuming the student is maintaining their top speed of 5 meters per second. So the integral is going to be 5t plus some constant. Where again, as before, this, this constant is, I mean, we can tell here that if you evaluate, <clears throat> if you evaluate x of s at t at 0, you get 5 times 0 plus c. So the c is the initial value of the position. And from our modeling, we've declared that to be minus 20. So our xs function is... So x of t is 5t minus 20, for some reasonable <coughs> interval of time, as long as the student can maintain that top speed. And for the bus, well, the bus, we've got to start with the acceleration. So the velocity of the bus is the integral of acceleration plus dt. So this is the integral of 2 dt. So this is 2t plus another constant, where the constant is the initial value of the bus, which we decided was 0. The initial value of the velocity of the bus, which we decided to be 0. <coughs> so that's 2t. And the position of the bus at time t will be the integral of 2t. t. So in other words, t squared. Plus maybe this other constant, but again, constant is the initial value of the bus, which we declare to be zero. <coughs> Remember our bus, the back of the bus is starting at position zero. So, so we've got x of, sorry, that should have a subscript s. We've got x of s of t, we've got x b of t. So maybe now we can tackle this question. x s of s equals x b of t. So that's the same as saying, that's equivalent to 5t minus 20 being equal to t squared. Is, it, is that ever true? Well, I mean, we recognize that kind of question. It's, it's this kind of question. <coughs> is t squared minus 5t plus 20 ever zero? Okay. If it is zero for some positive values of t, then those will be positive values of t for which these two quantities are equal. So that would be the, bus, the student has reached the back of the bus and they can step on. Okay, well, that's a quadratic equation. We know all about them. We saw them. We can look at uh, apply the quadratic formula. But when you try and apply that the quadratic formula to that, when you examine the discriminant, which remember is the square of the t coefficient minus four times the product of the other coefficients. Well, the b squared is twenty-five, but the four times the product of these is is eighty. So twenty-five minus eighty. So we've got a negative discriminant. This quadratic has a negative discriminant. Okay. 
negative discriminants. So there are no real solutions. <coughs> There will be complex valued solutions, but they won't correspond to the value of time <clears throat> in a simple way. So our conclusion is <coughs> the student misses the bus. It says no value of no value of t for which x of s is equal to x of b. Okay, any, uh, any questions on that? <coughs> Was the bus just going? Well, of course, the bus was going too fast for that student. Could any student have reached the bus? Could any student have caught that bus? Well, the student would have to be running faster. Yeah. <clears throat> what if the velocity of the student was greater than, uh, so what was it, five, five meters per second? Well, maybe some students can run faster. <clears throat> So, see, in general, the position of the student, see, the position of the student here came out as 5t minus 20, which was really bs of 0 times t minus 20. It's the same student starting 20 meters away. So this coefficient of the t, that 5, is really the initial, is, is the student's top speed. So then the question becomes, and the question is, are there solutions to t squared minus bs naught t uh, plus 20 equal to 0? OK, this. Yes, well, it was <coughs> the initial, sorry, that, that, that kind of suggests it's the initial velocity. Yeah, yeah, let's. Or more correctly, t squared minus vs t plus 20. So this, this vs is the student's top speed. We're assuming they can they can maintain for a reasonable period of time, some shortish period of time. So does this have solutions? But again, you use the discriminant that b squared minus four ac quantity. So this has real solutions. When b squared minus four ac, which is b s squared. Uh, minus 80 equals zero. That's the first, that's the, well, it has to be greater than or equal to zero, but the first time it is greater than or equal to zero is when it's equal to zero. That will give you the smallest value of the S for which that's true. Um, so in other words, I, the S must be the square root of the square root of 80. The square root of 80 is 4 times <coughs> the 
is 80 is 16 times 5, so the 16 square root, you take it out, so it's 4 root 5. 4 root 5 is approximately 8.94 meters per second. <clears throat> Would the students have that speed? So this equates to, this is equivalent to, equivalent to covering 100 meters in 11.18 seconds. Which I think for a, for a good student athlete, they could probably do that. Especially if they weren't making a standing start, if they were already jogging towards the bus when the bus started pulling away and just quickly hit their top speed. <coughs> of course, we want to work out the time, the value of time. <coughs> We want to work out the actual t value that this happens at. So if it's t equals like greater than 20 seconds, well, we might debate whether even a bit badly could maintain their top speed for 20 seconds. Maybe, maybe not. What at what t value? What t value is this solution obtained. Well, the solution will be minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Well, if b squared minus 4ac is 0 at this time, it'll be minus the b. So that'll be equal to just Vs over 2a. So this Vs we worked out as being 8.94 seconds. So yeah, this seems quite reasonable. So 8.94 over 2. So 4 point, 4 point something, 4.4 something. Yeah, if they're running that fast, they can. But if they're running at, you know, if, if they're already at their top constant velocity, and slower than this 8.94, okay, they'll come down close to the bus if they're just a little bit slower, but the bus, they will never actually reach the back of the bus. Okay, any, any uh, questions or queries about that? I mean, it does make sense to go and check the check when the solution occurs, because it's like if that t value was like 30 seconds or something, well, then it would be quite unreasonable because nobody can maintain their top speed in seconds. But maintaining it for up to 20 seconds, I think, is reasonable. <coughs> Okay, so we could maybe get started on, on the third question. Um, so this says you're on a window, 18 meters above the ground, and you want to send the stone out the window so it'll be in the air for exactly three seconds. <coughs> How should you throw it? Here's the building, there's the window, 18 <coughs> meters above the ground. Or 80 meters above the ground. How should you throw the stone? Put your hand outside the window, the stone. Do you just let it drop? <coughs> Do to throw it down towards the ground? Does it need to reach the ground quicker than it would if it's just released? Or do you need to 
throw it up in the air a bit so that it's going to be in the air longer. Now, there's a, there's a kind of a basic principle here about the way gravity works. Well, you can just assume, we'll assume we'll either release, throw it <coughs> vertically down, or vertically up. So we're either going to send the thing, chuck it down, throw it up, or just let go. We happen to be at the precise height where it's going to stay in the air for three seconds. So I will assume this is done by setting the initial velocity, by setting v of zero, the initial velocity of the stone. That's what you do when you throw a stone. You can't accelerate. You can't throw a stone so that it accelerates. Well, it'll, ex it'll accelerate under gravity, under the influence of gravity. But if you throw it, it's not going to get faster going away from you because you're throwing it really hard. No, just when you throw something, you impart some initial velocity on it because it's traveling at the same speed as your hand is when you, when you let go. Okay? So you affect, when, when you throw something, what you're doing is you're giving it an initial velocity. Gravity is in the picture operating. Well, we seem to make some, well, we need to make some decisions about what's the, what's the positive direction. No, no God-given reason why the positive direction has to be up, it could be down, but let's just say the positive direction in X is up, and I mean, it makes sense to make the ground zero level. And then the location 18 is important, that's the initial position of the stone. So then gravity becomes going in the negative direction, minus 9.8 meters per second per second. So what's our stone doing? Our stone, our stone has position x of t with the initial position at time zero is 18 meters. The clock starts ticking at time <coughs> zero. And initial velocity equal to, well, v. <coughs> So this is to be found. This is the end. So this is whether you throw it up, throw it down, or release it. <coughs> so like releasing it is v equals zero. Throwing it up is some kind of velocity greater than zero, and throwing it down is some kind of velocity negative velocity. Yeah, that makes sense. Because if the x, if the positive direction of position is upwards, so positive velocity means we threw it up. Negative velocity means we threw it towards the ground. And zero initial velocity means we just released it. But this is the initial velocity, okay? Because from, from time greater than zero, then the gravity comes in, right? To change the velocity. And the influence of gravity is constant for everything close to, for every free body close to the, close to the surface of the Earth. The acceleration will be approximately 9.8 meters per second per second downwards. And it's, that's acting constant. So what we're also doing here is we're also ignoring <laughs> Ignoring effects of air resistance. The air resistance will act on the stone, but that will be dependent on the stone's shape. That will depend on the shape of the stone and what, if it's irregular shape, what orientation it has to the direction of travel. But ignoring that, because for small, heavy stuff, that effect is quite small. 
and so we'll ignore the effects of error resistance. So we want to determine, we want to find the value of V that gives, so we want it to hit the ground after three seconds. So we want x of 3 <coughs> to be equal to 0. And x of t to be greater than 0 for values of t between 0 and 3. So we don't want it to have reached the ground for time equals 3, but at t equals 3, we want it to be contact with the ground. So the steps here would be to obtain a suitable expression for, for x of t. Hopefully we'll get it as some kind of polynomial in t. Constant acceleration should come out as some kind of quadratic in t. Because the constant acceleration is integrated twice to produce a quadratic expression for the position. Um, now this will, of course, depend on t, which, but it'll also depend on v. Solve for x of 3 equal to 0, and hopefully the learn v from this. And whether if V is positive, that means you're throwing the stone upwards with that initial velocity. Downwards, if V is negative, means you're throwing it down. Okay, but I'll leave you to do that yourselves. And uh, make some assessment of the this initial velocity where it's a reasonable throw you could do. I think it's having something stay up in the air for three seconds is a reasonable, a reasonable task. Okay, so when, when I see you tomorrow, we'll have a look at the mock papers, and I'll have there uh, some I'll have full solutions ready for tomorrow. Please bring any questions or queries about anything to tomorrow's lecture as well. Thank you.